The series of talks, of which this is the first, are to be about the properties of matter. I plan to show you a number of experiments which illustrate the common properties of matter, and also, I hope, which will explain to a certain extent why these properties, the way in which these properties arise from the structure of the matter. And I'm going to start with one of the most familiar things of all. The three great states of matter, as they're called, solid, liquid, and gas. The solid, which has both a shape and a volume. Liquid, as we say, which has a volume but no shape, it can change its shape in any way. And a gas, which has neither shape nor a volume. The three great divisions of matter, earth, sea, and air, if you like. And uh, we'll start off with, again, uh, this difference between the forms of matter in a very familiar form indeed. The different forms which water can assume. If it's cooled down sufficiently, it's ice. Here I've got a block of ice. In its normal state, it's water, such as I've got in this flask here. And if I make this kettle boil, steam comes from it. You recognize the steam by this kind of cloudiness coming out, but actually steam itself is quite invisible. It's because the steam is condensing into little drops of water that we see the cloud. Now, why these three different forms? Well, again, we know it's a matter of heat. If we cool water down, it turns into ice. If we warm the water up, it turns into steam. They're all different forms of one and the same thing. Here's my block of ice. Mr. Coates here will hand me a red hot poker. Now, if I take this by its end and plunge it into the ice, it melts it into water. And perhaps you can see some of that water where the poker touches it is actually turning into steam. So in that way, we have all the three forms coming along at one and the same time. And if we like, uh, we can do it the other way around. Here is the steam again coming out of my kettle, which I'll make boil. Now, if we play that steam onto a sheet of perspex that I've got here, it will, of course, very familiar effect indeed, condense down again and turn into water. There you see the steam condensing on the perspex running down as little drops of water. Or to do it in a rather more spectacular way, let's take the next change of turning water back into ice. I have got some liquid air here. Uh, air is a typical gas, but you probably know that if you cool air sufficiently, you can turn it into a liquid. Uh, this is a pot of liquid air here. Of course, this is very cold indeed. And to this air, the room and all around it is absolutely red hot. For instance, if I pour some of this air onto the table, it runs about as if the table were actually red hot. Well, now I've been cooling down a ball, a brass ball, in some liquid air in this pot here. I'll take it out and this is quite a dramatic way of showing the water to ice change. You will see, if I just plunge this into this water, I've turned the water into ice which surrounds this sphere. So, this change, backwards and forwards, is a matter of temperature, of just warming up or cooling down. Well, now, let's look into this a little bit more closely. And at once, as all scientists do, 
we have to start talking about atoms and molecules, the little building bricks of which matter is made. Atoms, which are the building bricks, the simplest of all, the atoms of the elements, which are all exactly alike, and what is more common, of course, the molecules, the little family parties of atoms uh, grouped together, which build up different kinds of solid bodies. And just remind you, any object like this, like this steel ball I'm holding in my hand, if we could magnify it up sufficiently, we would see that it was a mass of tiny atoms of iron in this steel, all in motion. Heat is agitation. What we call warming a body up is merely making the atoms of it, or the molecules of it, vibrate faster. Mind you, that wasn't always believed. The first idea of the nature of heat was that it was a kind of invisible fluid called caloric. That when you warmed a body up, you were pouring this fluid caloric into it. That when you cooled it down, you were taking caloric out of it. A great scientist who helped very much to put the theory of heat on a proper footing was Count Rumford. He had made, he was once, one time in charge of an arsenal, and when he was boring the cannon in the arsenal, they, it produced so much heat that he simply couldn't believe the caloric theory was right. According to the caloric theory, boring the cannon squeezed caloric out of the cannon, and that's where the heat came from. Rumford was certain this must be wrong, uh, that actually uh, you were conveying energy and agitating the molecules of which the cannon was made, and that's what made it hotter. Well, here is a kinetic model to illustrate the difference between the solid, the liquid, and the gas. We, we, we've got a pot here, and the molecules, well, they're actually little pop beads. And we've got a plate underneath, which can be agitated by an alternating electrical current, and by means of a variac, which Mr. Coates can control, uh, we can give it any agitation we like. A solid. A solid is a body which has a definite shape and a definite volume. And when the molecules in the solid are agitated, they, though they wriggle about, though they're in vibration, they, vibration is not sufficient to make them change their places. That's why it's a solid with a definite shape. Mr. Coates put very little agitation on there. You can see them all just moving, but not changing place. Now, what is the difference between that and a liquid? A very small difference. In the case of a liquid, the agitation is just so much more that every now and then, one of these molecules can change place with its neighbor. And therefore, the whole liquid is what we call fluid. It can alter its shape. Mr. Coates will now agitate a little bit more, and you'll see them gently changing place. Now they're doing it. Still a definite volume. They're all sitting at the bottom of the pot, but they're moving about, changing place. Agitated still more, and the most lively ones break away from the surface of the liquid and fill the volume above. We, call, we evaporate the liquid. There, now, we've got a gas above that liquid. Right. As you see, they've got different velocities. It's, a, it's more adventurous and vigorous of them that come off, but they're boiling away the liquid into uh, gas. Here, now, we can perhaps compare the difference between these three types of body by thinking of people in different states. A solid. What is a solid? A rush hour jam. But absolutely nobody can move at all. A liquid, we might compare to a party like a cocktail party, where there are so many people jammed into the room, it's very hard to move, but if you want to go from one side of the room to the other to see a friend, you can occasionally change places with someone and work your way across the room. In the case of a gas, the molecules are free of each other. It's like a lot of people strolling about in Hyde Park. Of course, uh, uh, the molecules actually uh, collide with each other as they move about occasionally, something we wouldn't do in Hyde Park, but uh, 
that's because they're inanimate things. So gas is simply these molecules filling a large space and occasion dashing about in all directions, occasionally colliding with each other. Well, now I want to say a little bit more about the difference between a solid and a liquid. As I already said, it's a very small difference. If the atoms every now and then have a chance of changing place with a neighbor, then we've turned our solid into a liquid. But it's a very small chance. In actual matter, in a solid or a liquid, these atoms are making millions and millions of vibrations backwards and forwards every second. If every second they have a chance, and all those millions of shots are tries at it to change places, then it's a perfectly good liquid. To show how little that difference is, we're going to turn a solid into a liquid here, or rather a model of a solid into a model of a liquid. Uh, this model is a pot with sand in it, and as it is, you will see it behaves like a solid if I tilt it. It stays put, it's keeping its shape. But we only have to agitate this a very little by blowing some air in, and you'll see it now become quite like a, a liquid. I, I, I've got it such that it's like a glass of water almost, the way it swishes about. Here we've got the same thing on rather a larger scale. A large dish of this sand, where we can blow air in the bottom, is behaving like a solid, as you can see, because these steel balls are resting on the surface. Uh, but Mr. Coates has only to turn on a little air for them to sink as they would in a liquid and for anything light at the bottom to come up. Now we'll turn a little air on and there you see this ping pong ball we've buried has risen up to the top. It's quite liquid, you see it splashes just like a liquid, doesn't it? And I can even have such liquid properties that I can give my little dog a swim in it. So you see, really it's had all the properties now of a liquid. You know how camels are called ships of the desert. Well, if only we could get sufficient air supply under the Sahara, we really could sail the Queen Mary across it and have a real ship of the desert. Now, here is another phenomenon we're all familiar with, but let's try and explain it in terms of these atoms and molecules. Um, if our soup's too hot, we blow on it to cool it. Why? How does it cool it? It's not because our breath is cold, our breath is practically as hot as the soup is. Yet, as you know, if you raise a spoonful of soup to your mouth and it's too hot, you can cool it down a bit by blowing on it. Perhaps you will remember when we worked this bead model of a solid liquid gas. When the beads came away to make a gas, it was the fastest, the most adventurous, so to speak, which managed to escape from the surface of the liquid and leap into the air to be a gas. There are all sorts of energies amongst these molecules. It's always the fastest that escape. Now, the real reason why we cool the soup when we blow on it is that from the hot surface of the soup, the most adventurous molecules are escaping into the air. And if we blow them away, we are robbing the soup of its molecules with the greatest energy and leaving the more sluggish ones behind. And so, of course, the soup gets cool. In a sense, that happens when you're not blowing, but then, of course, the fast ones stay near the surface of the soup, and most of them die back again, so it doesn't lead, lead very much, uh, lose very much energy. Here we've got a model of soup, and Mr. Coates will warm it up with a vibrator at the bottom, and then blow on it to cool it, and you see how the fastest ones will be blown away. Now, I might say that once when I showed this experiment before, uh, a critic uh, wrote to me afterwards to say, why do you go to all that trouble to explain why the soup gets cold? 
surely it's simply the phenomenon known as latent heat, that it takes a certain amount of energy in the form of latent heat to turn the liquid into a gas. And of course he was perfectly right, but also he had completely missed the point. What I was trying to do was to explain what was happening physically, what was actually taking place to make the liquid cool. When we've got that idea into our heads, we call it latent heat. We wrap up the idea in a parcel and put a little label on it, latent heat. So if we ever want it again, there it is, ready to use. But to say you've explained it by calling it latent heat really is not so at all. You do not explain a thing simply by giving it a name, the most important thing to remember in science. Further to the nature of a gas, we say a gas is a number of particles, molecules and atoms dashing about in all directions and colliding with each other. They also, of course, they collide on the walls of a vessel in which the, the gas is enclosed. And it's that bombardment of the walls of the vessel that we call pressure of the gas. It's pressing the wall back in the same way that a screen would be pressed back if we bombarded it with a lot of stones. This pressure is quite considerable and one or two well, pretty ways to illustrate it. Uh, if you drop a drop of water onto a warm plate, it just dries out. But if the plate's very hot, red hot, instead of the water just drying out, it collects in little uh, spheres of water, little bubbles of water, which run about all over the place. Because the bottom of the water, the molecules, are evaporating so fast that they are bombarding backwards and forwards between the water and the plate. You've got a little layer of air there, and the water never really touches the plate. We don't really have to go to water in a hot plate to show that. Here's my liquid air again, and you will see that I pour a little of that liquid air over the table. The table is red hot to the liquid air, and it runs about as little drops. There they are, running about over the table. And this dish is red hot, this silver dish, to the liquid air. If I pour a little liquid air into this dish, now, can you see it runs about, it's not evaporating at all, it just runs about quite freely over the bottom of the dish. We will show the same experiment in a rather different way. Mr. Coates has been heating up a small silver crucible to very bright red heat. If we place that on the surface of water, again this bombardment of the molecules stops the dish touching the water. So you will see this little film of gas in between the dish and the water. Then as the dish cools down, uh, this bombardment is no longer able to keep it up and with a little kind of fizz, it sits onto the water and little steams formed and the dish immediately goes cold. So there, you will see floating uh, on the water with this film of gas in between. If we take all the air out from a vessel, make a vacuum inside, we say that the sides of the vessel are being sucked in. Well, of course, that's rather a roundabout way of putting it. If, we've, if there's nothing inside the vessel, it can't be doing anything. It isn't the inside that's being sucked in, it's the outside which is being pushed in. And I'll end up my experiments with a rather graphic one to show how strong this ordinary bombardment of the air is. Of course, we don't worry about it because we've got air outside and inside us, and we don't collapse because the air inside us is pushing as hard as the air outside. But here, Mr. Coates has been heating a tin can which has got a little water in it. And that water has turned into steam. If he takes it off the flame and puts a cork in it so as to block it up and puts it here, 
I can now condense that steam by pouring water on it and you'll see the effect on the tin can. Immediately see the steam condenses, there's nothing bombarding inside and so the pressure of the air outside is able to show how strong it is. Well now in this talk I've been saying a great deal about atoms and molecules. One has to in order to explain the properties of matter. So in the next talk I'm going to say something about these atoms and molecules, their nature and the nature of the forces that bind them together.